as, uh, as, as we described, the compression piston assembly is uh, valve body, flexible valving shims, the uh, uh, inner chamber spring is being affected by the oil that is being pushed into the, the cartridge and moving this out of the way. One of the other things that's a, a, a very valuable tuning option is the uh, inner chamber spring. So this is the inner chamber spring that we use. You can see the rake is very mild. Uh, wire diameter is a little bit uh, more more slender than the, the standard item. We take out the, uh, the, the stiffer spring and replace it with one that is more responsive, more light. I'm freaking, I'm, I'm terrified of mixing shit up. <laughs> this is the compression piston assembly. And um, the oil would be displaced and forced through these flexible valving shims, which we, again, we have numerous flexible valving shims. And uh, it, the manipulation of the thickness and diameter is the way that we control oil flow at the compression piston assembly. So we have a number of them that are a similar diameter, and we start to reduce in size the way that a leaf spring would work. Um, the uh, uh, size of the last valving shim is what we call the pivot, and that's very effective. So when we uh, are compressing the, the, the fork, the uh, The oil is being forced through there, opening this check valve when the fork is rebounding. And then on rebound, we have a check valve here that opens and lets the oil flow back in and refill the cartridge. The, these are all different valving shims. So they're all different thickness and diameter valving shims. And, and we were in the business of actually selling those those items for a long time, but I don't do that anymore. I just, yeah, pretty much, you know, have that stuff for my own use. Uh, what's your R and D yeah. to determine what the valving should be? So often experience, we know what, uh, uh, what areas control what function, but also I think that the biggest thing that we do is we track the, uh, 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 the, the progress of our customers, number one, and I think that one of the things that I've been able to be successful with is to tease out the information from the riders to specifically get to where we can help them the best. So we've been involved with numerous riders that won ECEA championships, national championships, all those type of things. And I think that that's probably something at this point for me that I'm pretty good at asking the questions until we get the answers that get us to the heart of the, the matter. As we do some work with the Rehu, and uh, we've done a lot of the Shercos at this point, and uh, we think that that's important because all these guys need to have somewhere to go. And uh, if if a, if a guy was a bigger maker, maybe they can afford to um, to stick with the the main brand. I think anybody that's doing this type of work right now is doing an awful lot of WP, as we do as well, uh, but. Um, work on a lot of stuff and even for a long time did a lot of vintage stuff but I'm doing less vintage now because it's never easy to work on something when it's 40 years old. Yeah. <laughs> All the metal soft. <laughs> the um, manufacturers can get something like 15 or 18 percent total max min adjustment range on compression or rebound and if a, if a manufacturer is offering, typically KYB has 21 clicks per adjuster, rebound, and compression. Some of the other ones, they'll have a little bit different uh, uh, click number between compression and rebound. But if, if it's even 40 clicks, it's typically the same 15 or 18% diced up in little bit smaller bites. So there's, there's only so much that can be done with that. And as we open up that bleed bypass, and all those are some sort of variation of a needle and seat, uh, you know, as we 
turn counterclockwise, we're allowing or more oil flow. As we turn clockwise, we're, we're shutting down the, the oil flow. If we have the oil flow too quick, we start to lose low speed feel in these damping units. So if we don't have any low speed, the bike may seem supple, but it's oscillating up and down all the time. So we want to control the uh, uh, steering angle. We want to control the chassis movement. And we also want to feed something back into the chassis. If we get stuff so soft or we remove so much low speed, then we may be following the roots and rocks really nicely. But then when we get that deflecting blow, it, it may seem much more pronounced because the chassis is not absorbing any of that blow. The, all, all we've got is the wheels following the ground. We would say ideally we want the, the, the best and closest to the most of your activity to be somewhere in the middle of the range. So with, with KYB stuff for rocky conditions, we would like to have the customer find their self uh, you know, kind of ideally suited somewhere between, let's say, 11 and 16 clicks, maybe a little bit on the softer side. But uh, if, if it has to be full out just to ride the bike, then we, we've, we've missed the, the sweet spot. And what would you do for with my ZF shock? So what we're doing with the ZF shock is... Put it on eBay and find a KYB from no, a 2020. <laughs> <laughs> what, we're, what we're doing with the ZF shock is we use the, the uh, KTAC piston assembly and the KTAC piston assemblies are four port and the, uh, the standard piston assembly is three port. So with the four port, we're actually able to use a little bit more valving and still have more supple movement. So we got good, we got good settings for that uh, ZF shock. Uh, for 2023, Beta has uh, uh, switched to KYB shocks for their race version machines. And uh, uh, it, not only am I kind of happy about that because the accessibility of, of KYB is really good for the average customer. Anybody can, you know, that does this kind of work is going to be able to service a shock like this. But uh, one of the things that I noticed right away in the uh, case of the... Uh, um, Rahu and the Sherco, they're using the 18 millimeter shaft on the shock absorber, and Beta have chose to use the 16 millimeter shaft. And as we discussed earlier with the fork, as the shaft is going into the shock, it's displacing some oil. That oil is traveling around to the reservoir area, and that's how the uh, compression adjuster and high speed compression adjuster function but when we use the bigger shaft we use the more plus minus uh, uh, adjustment we will have but we also change the speed of the flow of the oil between the main body and the reservoir housing so in that case we think that the larger shaft is gonna be a little bit more uh, uh, harsh on quick movement like roots and rocks. So I think, in my opinion, I, I would say that my choice would be the 16 millimeter shaft being the better option, especially for like the tactile feel, slippery roots and rocks, things like that. We're happy that the, um, the beta engineers chose the 16 millimeter shock shaft. And, uh, you know, we've seen some uh, instances of the ZF shocks having the, the anodization fail kind of early, especially if people exceeded the um, service interval. But KYB uses a casted body and, and the European manufacturers like WP and ZF, their parts are all CNC machined and made up as a, a package of parts. And it may seem kind of like a quick and dirty type of way to do something to have a casting, but the, the reality is that when we make a casting, there's many things that can be introduced into the casting uh, material to make it much harder. So this is a casting. They can use things like silicone in the casting and, and make it very hard. So the, 
the the body, the bore, the anodization is 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 very uh, uh, reliable on the KYB product. So we have a uh, closed chamber fork, and then we have an open chamber fork. In the case of the closed chamber fork, it's a like a, 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 a fully enclosed shock absorber within itself. And that's really good to keep from having any cavitation or foaming when we have dramatic movement. So uh, this is a sealed shock absorber in this case. And uh, all of the oil that is in the shock absorber is taking care of the damping functions. And then the oil on the outside of this shock absorber takes care of lubricating the bushings in the fork and setting the air chamber so we have some increase in uh, pressure as we go through the stroke. So this is an open chamber cartridge and as you can see it's got some holes in it and it's in a bath of oil all the time. So this type of design would be more prone to uh, foaming or some cavitation but the, the positive part of it is that you're recirculating all the oil all the time. So that entire volume of oil does both the damping function and the lubrication function. So in a, in a higher mileage type vehicle, we would often find that the uh, open chamber design is a good option. With the closed chamber design, we have to keep up on our... Uh, on our service interval, and some people might even notice that when they get 60, 70 hours on the forks, they have a service that when they get back on the bike that the bike feels more lively, damping seems to be revived, everything's kind of better, you know what I mean? And what we have is called shearing, and that is uh, uh, what, what, what is going on is we have uh, uh, polymers in the oil they keep the oil consistent in its uh, uh, viscosity. So the way the polymer work is like a spider. And uh, as the uh, uh, polymer heats up, those little spider webs come out like this and, and make the molecule larger. And uh, uh, after a while, because of wear, the little hairs on the polymer will start to get sheared off. And that's what's called shearing. So the uh, uh, efficiency of the oil will reduce. Outstream product, the K K uh, KTM, Husqvarna, or Gas Gas, their enduro versions of the bike are all open chamber forks. All of their XC or SX version bikes are a closed chamber design. So again, we're seeing, you know, in, a, in an environment like a uh, full race environment where we're going to be able to do that service in a, in, a, in a timely manner, then we're choosing the closed chamber design. And then maybe in a little higher mileage type environment, like to ride the whole ISDE on those bikes, sometimes that still may favor the uh, open chamber fork. Really? So you're saying- It's it, still a good design. If you, know, there, there, if you were setting a bike up for the ISDE. I, I think that that would be in, in, in one instance where that would be a consideration. But would you do it? Sure. Really? You wouldn't use the I, I, fancy closed chamber for? We, we work on those forks all the time. I think we've got great settings for the uh, Explorer forks. All right. And, and, and plenty of top level guys using that and, and very effectively. The KYB sealed chamber forks. The uh, cartridge rods are, are anodized really nicely. And, and then on some of the ZF open chamber forks, they're not anodized at all. And anytime that we anodize something, we're fighting contamination and uh, the oil will go a lot longer before it gets dirty and, and starts to uh, deteriorate and create some possibility for wear. So oh, it was uh, fashionable on the Japanese motocross bikes to all use air forks. They've gone back to steel springs yeah, for the most part. Yeah. Um, the WP fork is still so an air fork. We're going we're to work on uh, uh, 
WP stuff and and I, it's just some some comments and and maybe this is just laying the groundwork for some more uh, discussion in the future. But when we take the direction of having an air fork, the problem with an air fork is that air doesn't increase its rate in a linear way the the way that a spring does. So air increases its rate and mo much more dramatically increases as we go further into the stroke. And what it, that uh, phenomenon was known as was a J-curve. So all of the Japanese versions of air forks, they had like a, what they called a balance chamber. So they had some negative air pressure that helped to fight that uh, dramatic increase as you went through the, uh, the stroke. The way that WP uh, uh, fights that phenomenon is they have a, a, a dimple in the air cartridge. So within the fork on the air side, there's something that looks like a cartridge. And part of the way through that, that stroke, there's a little dimple that lets a little bit of air sneak by. So the, the earlier versions, they had a little tiny dimple and that allowed for the guys that were riding off-road to uh, uh, run very low pressures. But then subsequently, the, the people on the SX side or GNCC side were complaining that those forks were going through and, and finding the uh, uh, maximum travel, some bottoming. So what they did was they made that dimple bigger, which actually flattened the curve a little bit more, but it also, uh, 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 it re required a lot more air pressure at the beginning to hold the bike up properly. So we find with those bikes, the newer versions of those Air Fork uh, WP, that we like to use a, a spring conversion. We can choose a, a, a pretty light um, spring rate. And the spring conversion that we use is the KTAC, and the KTAC has hydraulic anti-bottoming. So we can choose a pretty light rate and still have like hydraulic antibottoming so we never have any sensation of, of bottoming.